Okay. All right, friends. Thank you so much for joining me today. This is the second and the last class for watercolor phrases. The next stage program is brought to you by Heal Her Art and sponsored by the American Legion Auxiliary Foundation, Veterans First, the Arizona Commission on the Arts, and the American Legion Auxiliary Unit 62 in Peoria, Arizona. I want to also, let's see, make, make my um, screen, the pin screen here. So bear with me one moment. See, I'm going to stop sharing. I want to make sure that I get the screen that you see uh, large. So I'm going to make sure. Okay, so turn this on. So I want to make sure I'm not pinned on where my hand is moving and that I am spotlight video on me. Okay. Okay, friends, uh, if someone would mind, please just giving me a thumbs up um, that you can see on your screen large, the Next Stage program and Heal Her Art. Okay, thanks, Pamela, you're the best. All right. Okay, so today we're gonna be talking about a few troubleshooting. Uh, we're also gonna be talking about cropping our watercolor artwork. There are some things that we should and should not do. And then lastly, matting and framing the watercolor artwork. Okay, so you um, remember that this past week I did send out some examples of ways to embellish your watercolor phrases if you were having some mental blocks. So I did a quick Google search. Uh, it's a Google search on uh, patterned fonts or uh, uh, drawn fonts or something like that. So I think I put pattern fonts. And so I came up with images of different kinds of fonts that have different shapes in them. And that really helped me think outside the box. So that will help fill the space with some creative interest. And I want to show you how uh, one of your classmates took this example or these um, sources of inspiration here, uh, took it and used it to turn their artwork into something a little bit more, not only aesthetically pleasing, but really um, it had more depth. Okay, so this is an example from one of the participants here. And so they were okay with their artwork, you can see on the left, but they were feeling like maybe it lacked a little bit of something. So uh, after reviewing that inspiration that I sent out uh, with the fonts, the artist continued to embellish the artwork and you can see a huge difference here, like I was saying. Um, the work on the right keeps me captivated much longer and I really am enjoying that work and feel more value in that work and I can see more of the effort and time and love put into that artwork than I can on the right. Now, mind you, the one on the, on the right, excuse me, the one on the left, Though it is very nice and clean, beautiful watercolor, you can just see your eyes, when you look at both of them, just automatically gravitates to the left. You can just see, you know, you want to look at that artwork because of how much is going on and you, and you can feel the passion in the work. Okay. So, uh, traditionally, I'm gonna be talking about watercolor paper here because I, before I get into the technicalities of matting and framing, I need to tell you a little bit of background about watercolor paper. So watercolor paper comes from, usually, traditionally, is a large sheet. And so it's, it is a pressed type of paper, and the edges are not uh, cut straight. They are very organic. And so these large sheets are most economical, but about mm, two decades ago or so, watercolor paper became much more widely available uh, in smaller, more travel-friendly pads. And so with that, 
yeah, it's a great, it, but it's not as economical, but you're also limited to the size of the pad. So on the left here, I have uh, got a visual diagram of how it is easy to tear down your watercolor paper. It, it may sound silly, but you know, the, the paper is supposed to always be torn and never cut. You are not ever, ever, ever supposed to use scissors on watercolor paper. That is always how it has been. And, and some actual artists who are uh, watercolor enthusiasts and have been trained by watercolor masters, they make these rulers, you can see on the right, to act to uh, give that more of that frayed edge, that more organic edge to their watercolor paper. And um, I, I can't do that very well because I'm such a particular kind of person that though I am fine with that, okay, yes, frayed edge, all right, I'm gonna do it. Um, I personally prefer measuring out the paper and then just using my metal ruler and ripping it. You know, in college, I had some professors who were all about ripping the paper on the edge of a real sharp sharp table and that never worked for me so the ruler method is perfect for me i use a metal ruler and i have to kind of stand up and put some weight down on the paper and then i tear it in fact that's what i did for all of your paper is i hand tore all of your paper from much larger sheets and uh, so just so you know that is the watercolor way jaggedy edges all right, so I'm going to quickly uh, show you how I tear watercolor paper and how I mount it on board. And I'm going to spotlight this video. Okay, so I've got my watercolor artwork here. And if I were to just mount the watercolor paper as is, I would have taped off my border. I would not have left all of this on the outside because technically this is my space to test out my, my colors before using them on my watercolor art. So I tape all of this to have a nice clean edge. Okay, so, but I'm gonna say for uh, demonstration purposes, I love this artwork and I, I even like those extra overlapping lines there. It shows that uh, I can stay in the lines for one, but I'm an artist and I measured everything out. Okay, so then I put my ruler down here and usually uh, I will line it up with the edge of the art and I'll give it some space. Now we will pretend as if I don't necessarily have this other paper here that I'm gonna be using. So I would try to keep it relatively equal distance all around, relatively. We don't need to be uh, too particular on that. And so I will, let's just say, sure. Okay, I'm particular, I measured it out, and that's, this is the line I want. So I put my hand down the ruler. Now I have done this with the wooden rulers, but uh, it, you really have to put a lot of weight on it, where I can do this with a metal ruler and not worry about uh, any problems. So as I work my way down, I move my hand down the ruler and I tear the paper, okay? Now, it is a little bit more challenging to tear the watercolor paper. Let's say I want to tear um, a smaller edge. I wanna tear right up to the artwork. It is a little bit more challenging to tear a shorter edge. So you can go one of two ways. And I would test this out on your, on your sample here. You can try to tear it from the small section. I can see I'm having a hard time here, but it can be done, okay? Or you can put the ruler on the artwork, nope, wrong way, on, on the uh, edge, and then you can tear so that you're holding more when you rip, but there's not as much underneath the ruler here. So you're at risk of it getting loose and coming out, okay? So there's nothing wrong with tearing right to the edge of your artwork, okay? So that is the watercolor way, and I would not be doing my $100,000 fine art education any justice uh, by not sharing that with you. Okay, so. Um, the quickest and easiest, and actually a really nice and, and traditional way of sharing a watercolor or paper art is literally just mounting it onto a surface. 
And though you may say, okay, Dana, well, that black is really nice. This frame right here does not let the art breathe at all. You, with so much going on in the art, you want to captivate your audience and you want to really have them focus in on it. And this size of blackboard does not do it. So in the past and still today, I will give my art here a nice big black board. And when I place my art on that board, you can see, oh, come on, you can focus. Come on, artwork. Focus. All right. Well, though it's not in focus, you can still see the art, but you can see how it really just makes the art pop and your eyes are not worried about anything else in the periphery, just the work of art itself. Okay, so when I do this particular method, I'm gonna actually be using this piece of mat board for something else. So I'm gonna flip it over here. Um, I've got another uh, nice piece of artwork. Mat boards are not, are not cheap, but they're not overly expensive. I think I got a nice big 24 by 30 piece with a, 40% uh, off coupon for eight, $8. And so that will give me at least four or five works of art, depending on uh, how I map them. And so what I will do for my art is I will literally tack on the back side some tape. The tradition is to use acid-free tape in everything you do, archival tape, because what happens over time is that the, um, adhesives will start to corrode and ruin your artwork. Because I don't perceive myself being super famous, famous in my lifetime, I'm okay with using uh, tape that I wrap presents with. And I'm also okay with using double-sided regular tape for my projects. But I did, I do have a role of archival tape here and I put on, on the inside, um, acid free and I put that you could put archival too because it looks just like masking tape and it's way more than masking tape so I want to make sure I don't just use this willy-nilly on a project uh, so I marked it okay so if I were to mount right on my mat board I will use the double-sided tape and I will do it at um, I'll do it at the top and let it hang and just let it hang that is how I would do. But if you want it to be more affixed, you can certainly do the four corners. Uh, some artists will actually bring that tape in just a little bit so that the corner pops up just a tiny bit to let people know that it is a, an original work of art that is mm, organic, just like the paper that it's on. Okay, so that is 100% up to you how you want to do it, but I wanted to share that with you. And usually when I um, mat paper artwork in this manner, I will frame it with glass. In fact, all watercolors I frame with glass. Okay, so I have that now. I am going to let me see if I've got the rest. I want to show you a, a, other tradi a traditional way if you think that you want to be a little bit more professional than myself. I want to make sure that I show you. Let's see. Hmm. Um, open up here. I guess I must have. All right. Well, I will um, share this with you in a picture format. Oh, okay, great question here about presentation. When I say um, presentation, um, I am, I'm really referring to the final look of it. And so I have a, another question here about shadow boxes. And so the question is, uh, do you use a shadow box frame with a top mat? Okay, so I will move on to that. So you can mat over top your art, and I will go back to pinning my art here. You can go back to pinning your art, or excuse me, to your artwork with a regular mat here and, and affix it 
on top. I do not put this in a shadow box. I actually would just frame it as a picture. Uh, there's enough room in frames to allow for the mat and the artwork. And so a shadow box might, it, unless it's a reliquary, I think that might be a little too much for paper art. So this is another mat that I cut out with a mat cutter. It has a beveled edge, but there are many times when, I, and I do own one of these, uh, they're about mm, $35, $50. Um, it is a, a bar with a blade that's at an angle, and so that's what cuts these bevels. But you know what? I also use construction paper and use a blade and on the back here you can see just to reinforce those edges I just put my archival tape uh, on the edges and I would mount this artwork the same as if I had a map board uh, and that is it right there so the way that I mount my artwork because I'm a particular kind of person but at the same time I don't want to stress myself out is I'll use my tape here and I will put a piece hanging over the edge at one corner. Now many professional artists will do the diagonal first because you want to, your artwork to be kind of taut. You don't necessarily want any bubbles at, or in the paper and so before I do this process I will press my paper under some books uh, to make sure that it is relatively flat. And so I've got my two at an angle. Usually I don't follow this rule, though this is the professional fine art way at an angle. I'll, I usually put the two at the top. All right, so this is my construction paper and I will, I'll stand over top of it and then lay it where I want it to go and then I'll do the press down. But usually if I'm gentle enough, I can, I can kind of play around with and have some wiggle room if I don't press down. So, okay, so there you go. And I pressed it down. And so I'm, now I can flip it over and I can really reaffirm that adhesion there. And then again, make sure it's flat and tape the other two corners. So then this is ready here as is. Now I can also sign right on the mat. You can do it with just with a pencil. A pencil will look really nice on a black. Pencil also does look very nice on white or cream. And uh, you can sign it on the mat or if you, if you have enough room underneath, you can sign it underneath and then uh, allocate some extra space when you uh, trim your paper if you do it all and then that be also a part of your work of art so that is that is all I do with that um, so hopefully that will give you some ideas of how to present your art going forward uh, uh, hopefully you like this project enough that you would like to do it again and more of it because it, it's just so versatile there's so much you can do with watercolors for one and then the text. So with that being said, I am going to cancel my spotlight here. I will go to me. And um, so I have a great question about the construction paper being acid free uh, when using it as a mat. Great question. If you really value your artwork and want to take the time to frame it, you probably would want to do everything acid free. That way you're guaranteed later on down the road that there will be no corrosion in any fashion to your artwork. But as a starving artist, I know that that is not ideal or realistic for me to be concerned about that when I give it as a gift. I just want it to look good for the time being. Whatever happens, happens. It's, hey, it's on that now, right? But what, what you can do is, let me see, I want to share this uh, photo with you. I have a, um, an example of a professional uh, mat, a matting job, where people actually um, use a hinge. They make uh, mat boards, acid-free mat boards, and they make a hinge of those mat boards and then present that when they are um, 
showing artwork or selling it or giving it away. And this particular method uh, is uh, acid free, but allows the artwork to be protected and then also allows it to be easily taken out of that uh, uh, mat and put into another mat safely without damaging the artwork. Let's see here, let me show, pull that up. Oh, here we go. Okay, I am going to share that. Let me make it a little bit bigger here. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, so hopefully I am sharing this so oh, you can see it. I'm gonna try and make it bigger here. I know it's a tiny little one, but it is, uh, it does give you all of the details here. So if you just zoom in real close here, you see uh, there's two mat boards here. There is a piece of tape uh, adhering the two together that makes it a fold over. And then there are, there are pieces of tape that are face up and face down. So the horizontal tape here does not touch the artwork. Just the little tip of the uh, tape facing upward. Um, so that is the professional way. I'm gonna see if I can find another, I have another photo here of that. That is not, not common, but when you see at the art exhibit, um, uh, Tempe Art Festival or any type of art uh, shows, usually that is how it should be presented to you uh, as the purchaser of the artwork. Okay, so what I'd like to do now as I'm, oh, here's another one. I'll open this one up. Um, is I'd like to quickly show you this other example that I have. And then I would like to, if anyone would like to share their artwork, I would love for you to do so. And I'm gonna share this screen here quickly. Okay, so again, here is another example of the window mat. So it's cut open, then you have the uh, mat on the back side also. You've got your taped hinge, the acid-free tape is also used on the artwork, and then it is adhered onto the board with another piece of tape. So it is never touching the, uh, the tape is never adhered with the artwork to the board permanently. So you could easily cut that tape away and not uh, bend or tear the artwork when you're trying to remove it from that. That is the ultimate way, the end-all be-all of preserving and protecting fine art, photographs, anything that is of paper or malleable. So that is that. Okay, so I'm going to cancel my spotlight here and I would love to uh, see anyone who would like to share uh, I'd be happy to give you the spotlight. Just go ahead and let me know. Raise your hand or thumbs up or something. Gabe, is that you? Are you are you trying? Are you just stretching? <laughs> oh, okay. She she is ready. Okay, so I'm going to ask you to unmute here. Okay, uh, Gabe, but you should be unmuted. Okay. This is the name of our Facebook page, Women Are, the letter, Veterans 2. So, I, I don't know, I just thought that might be kind of fun using those fonts that you shared with us. And I thought it turned out real nice. And I'm, and I'm loving that watercolor. Great job, Gabe. Thank you for sharing. And you know, uh, you're... Um, the texture, the marking that you have on that artwork really gives it a lot of movement. Like it's, I mean, you can see not only do you have the, the lines kind of, of um, making the text moving on the page, but it almost is like, you know, there, those uh, letters are individually moving across the page, kind of like the, the dust behind it or something. <laughs> um, but well, it was fun. I, I played with that last night. Wonderful, thank you so much for sharing. 
right. Is there anyone else who would like to share? Oh, oh, Bonnie, all right. I was, I was going to, but I'm not going to after seeing hers because mine is so medial. <laughs> Barbara, you, well, oh, I, you this oh, I, it. There it is. I haven't finished it yet, but there it is. I gave you the pep talk. I know, you know. Well, maybe you'll reconsider in just oh. a few minutes after your fellow comrades uh, share. So um, it looks like uh, uh, Miss Connie, I think you said you were ready to share. And then um, I, it looks like I've got uh, Miss Jennifer next to share. I'm going to spotlight you. And um, you are. Okay. All right. Um, well, yeah, I didn't quite finish this, but uh, I am going to embellish the letters. But if you can see, it says, "He's done that." Tap dance your cares away. <laughs> That's good. That's cute. Move it back just a bit so we could see it. Huh? Move it back towards your face. Oh, there you go. Oh, that's nice. Yeah, I'm going to embellish and maybe put some little feet in the middle there where I have some space and because I really like those embellished letters. I just didn't have time to do them, but that's it. Well, thank you for sharing. Is there anything uh, particular about this project that you really enjoyed? I like watercolor, you know, and I've done it before. Okay. I, I really, it's very relaxing to me. Okay. So you are familiar with watercolors in general? Yeah. Oh, okay, good. Well, I hope you keep up with that and uh, and continue working on that project there. It definitely has a lot of potential and it's a great yeah. phrase. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so I'm gonna give Miss Jennifer an opportunity to share here and let me make sure I turn her. Oh, I think I, I'm, uh, there you go. It says, infuse your life with purpose. Oh, it's beautiful. Can you tell us, Jennifer, a little bit about your technique there for the, for the watercolor itself? Because this is not a technique that I um, instructed at all. Would you be willing to tell us a little bit about what you did and how you got that beautiful, um, it almost looks like a starburst or something? It does. Yeah, um, so I'm impatient. Um, and so what I did is I painted the paper first and then I took my brush and I started in the center and I just kind of drug it out until the color bled through. And I washed out some of the color to make it have that starburst effect. And then after I did that, I did my words and my marker. That is just gorgeous. What um, can you tell us a little bit more in detail about how you were able to get the color lifted from the, in the starburst section? Um, I filled my brush with water and I started here and then I just kept striping until it was light as I wanted it. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. And I would you. just tap the water off onto my towel. Perfect. And in fact, um, Jennifer, I'm glad you brought this up and, and did this technique because I don't know if any of you who may be unfamiliar with watercolor and were experimenting, but believe it or not, this is how watercolor artists remove color that they put down in a spot they didn't want. So, um, so thank you, Jennifer, for, for sharing that because it allowed me to mention that aspect of watercolor. Okay. Uh -huh. Let's see, uh, Ms. Terry, did you say you wanted to, wanted to give us a little show? Uh, sure. Okay. Uh, I, I did two, actually. Uh, oh. I don't know if you can oh, sorry, wrong, wrong Terry here. So sorry. Okay, there you go. So that's one. When it rains, look for rainbows. And then this one was the one I did actually first. Oh, both of them are fantastic. Yeah, so it was fun. I liked it. It was different. I use, I've i used pastels before, but this is the first time actually I've ever used uh, watercolor. So thanks. Thank you. Uh, you know, Terry, I, though it sounds like you um, 
are an art enthusiast and already a practicing artist, I would encourage you now that you have experimented with watercolors to maybe use your pastels to embellish some watercolor works. Oh, okay. I haven't never tried that before. Okay. Thank you for sharing. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Now, Miss Terry B. I'm sorry I had you originally spotlighted and I and I put you on, but I got the wrong Terry, and so I didn't want to forget you and, and give you the opportunity. Okay. All oh, right. Okay, this is the one that I did first, and I didn't really care for it because I my uh, colors were so blotchy. So I thinned my paint out and I tried till it comes out looking more like this. Mm -hmm. So then I did the, my final work um, was this one. Oh, what a, you can see your, your progress and your growth. That is, I mean, I thought the first one looked really nice because I, I enjoyed the colors and I didn't necessarily think it was blotchy, but I like, I'm not a water color snob, but I think that is gorgeous. Thank you so much for sharing. I mean, you can tell you put some time into those dots there. Great job. I hope you, you decide that you would like to um, mat and frame that because it really is nice. Thank, I might. <laughs> thank you for sharing. Okay, let's see. I think I saw some hands there. Oh, Miss Pamela. All right, I'm going to unmute you here, my friend. You have the floor. So oh, you have to unmute yourself. I un I asked you to unmute there. I want to make sure. Sorry about that. There you go. I did the inspired that was in the, the message that you sent out earlier. I did that last week when you were teaching. Sorry. I wasn't distracted. I was just really inspired by what you wanted us to do. And then um, I wrote my own messages and I said on this one I haven't finished it yet let me see here um it says goals are dreams put into motion so whenever you have a goal you you dream about it you believe in it and you put it into motion and that's what makes your goals attainable so then having gone to school and worked really hard to do well I dreamt that I could do it. I believed that I could do it and I achieved it. But as you can see there, it took a lot of hard work. I was up late night studying. So I got a little bit creative with my messaging and I thought, you know, this is, this is who I am. This is what I do. And so painting is my, Watercolor, I've actually had a class in college one. Um, and I love it. I love watercolor painting. I've taught some classes, but this was a fun project. I really enjoyed it. So thank you. It was, it was nice. Thank you so much for sharing it. I really liked the aspect of you adding uh, the books there, the, the lamp really helped with the message and gives it it gives it a different appeal, more of a illustration, more um, than just text. And so I, I am glad that you introduced that into your artwork. And I encourage uh, the other gals, if they want to take their phrases to the next level, it doesn't hurt to throw in a, a small, uh, small little drawing. And I think in my example for the initial class, I used a couple snowflakes because it was a winter type of, um, uh, phrase there, but you know, don't be afraid of adding some imagery into that. So thank you so much, Miss Pamela. I appreciate you uh, taking the time to share with us. That is very important. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, oh, Miss Shelley. All right, I'm going to unmute you there, my friend. You have the floor. Ooh. Um, life was meant for good friends and adventure. So um, I liked it. I haven't worked in this before. I didn't see all your fun fonts until like later. Um, but I, I added these little stickers, which I think I had this big block and it needed something. Um, um, I like it. I mean, I don't know. I think more time. 
the one thing I wanted to know is, and, and I think you can do this, is can you just paint it all first and then come back in and do the letters? Because I found, you know, I, I would go and be like, okay, I want the purple or I want the blue to be after every third and then I'd get off and, and I thought if I just painted it all first, that might, I, I might like to try it that way. Is that normal? That's a great question, Shelly. Thank you for, well, before I answer your question, I want to point out when you were holding up your artwork, other than those swirls in that midsection there, there was a decorative element that really popped out to me. And it's probably so silly to say so, but yes, those little tiny swirls. Mm -hmm. in there, what is that? I just used a white paint marker, fine tip paint marker. And I thought after I did, you know, kind of like once you're in it, you're kind of committed. But I thought maybe if I would have done it in the black versus the painted areas, like when we get to this green, it doesn't really show up. And I thought, oh, I might try that in with the blacks and be consistent. But I just added a little something kind of fun. It's I really, thought. it's nice. And, and that I from this <laughs> angle, it's subtle, but it's just enough to be like, hey, what is that going on there? Mm -hmm. So I like that. Um, so to answer your question, your question was about um, having a transition of colors or having more colors that aren't defined in the individual letters. Is, is that correct? It was just instead of putting the pencil marks down oh. first and then trying to paint in between all the little, um, you know, tops and bottoms, can I just paint the whole thing first and then come back in? And if so, do you, do you still do the pencil marks or at that point are you kind of, you need to just make it happen with a marker? Okay, so great question here. All right, so to answer your question, yes, you can, paint the whole background any watercolor you want and i think one of the other gals was it i think jennifer did that technique she painted the background whatever she wanted and then she put her text over top i don't know if she actually intended on uh, making the um making that background and i don't know if she put the text there before she painted that background, that's irrelevant. But my point is, is once you get that color in place, you're not going to want to try to lay out your text and erase that because that will affect your color. And so uh, I would recommend having either doing a, a transfer paper. So having it already mapped out on another sheet of paper, put your transfer paper down and then trace that on. And then you can go in either with the pencil, with the marker, or any other medium of uh, pastels that you would like over top for the text per uh, aspect of it. I have known some people who do like a mixed media type of application where they have their paper, their decorative uh, paper application in the background and they will print text because they feel like they're not very good at text they'll print it on acetate and they'll lay that on top of their artwork i don't know if that might be something you're interested in but the only downside of not mapping things out is that if you don't already have a plan and you start erasing it you can affect mm -hmm. that watercolor underneath now if you're like, you know, I'm going to go with it. Whatever happens, happens. Then why not? I think there, there's a couple of sheets of paper there uh, that was in your kit. And so you can experiment with that. And then, of course, you could always purchase some more if you wanted to. But you can also turn the paper over because the watercolor paper is the same on the front as the back. If you don't put that marker on there, um, uh, you know, it may show through when you put that marker on. But if you don't, you can keep putting watercolor on there and use that until you find a, a background that you prefer. So hopefully, did I answer your question, my friend? Okay, perfect. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you for sharing. Is there anyone else who would like to share? I don't ever want to assume that anyone would like to share, so I'm offering it up here. If anyone has any uh, questions, I am more than happy to answer any questions. Or if you forget a question, you want to shoot me an email, I'll be happy to answer that. Ms. Barbara, are you feeling feeling good that maybe you want to share? Maybe, um, let's see, I got a question coming here. Uh, yeah, I was going to say, I've got two things going here, so. Okay. 
First off, and this will answer her question because I painted right over my pencil letters. Okay. Oh, so, mm -hmm. Thank you for mentioning that. So you can do a light pencil marking to map mm -hmm. things out and then do your watercolor over top and mm -hmm. uh, it won't affect anything. And if you change your mind, the pencil can be light enough that um, you're not married to the original design. And then Alice asked me to show you, this is her piece. She had to go, uh, but this is her piece from the bottle. I don't know if you can yeah. see it. Are you I can't working? see anything. On? How do I do this? Uh, Liz just ask you to start your video. Okay, there you go. Sorry, this is all new to me, guys. That's all right. Normally, normally she does all this stuff. Oh my gosh. Uh, Alice does all this stuff and I don't do anything. Okay, here we go. This is, this is Alice's piece on the bottle. Oh, very nice. Oh, a beautiful job. Beautiful job. So, a new bottle. Friends, if you are watching this um, and you're just joining us, the the we did um, a glass painting activity a couple months back in October with enamel paints on glass, and so uh, Alice um, was able to complete that, and it looks very pretty. Oh, I like that blue top. That's oh yeah, cool. it's a neat bottle. It's a neat bottle. Yeah. Well, thank you for sharing that. And so you said, Barbara, you had some watercolors you'd like to share? Oh, this is, I did, this is how I did the, I, I'm just, again, beginning. I'm a beginner artist where you guys have been doing this for a while. This is my, like, you know, third time of picking up a paintbrush. Um, so this is what I did, though, but I did uh, map out my words first and then... Uh, did the watercolor in all my sections, and now after after this dries, I will do my letters. Can you tell us what your uh, phrase is, please? Uh, mine says, "Only in the darkness can you can we see the stars." Oh, very nice, wonderful. Well, Miss Barbara, thank you so much for sharing, and uh, thank you, Alice, for for sharing your bottle. Wait, wait, wait. Now this one I'm proud of. Okay. Ta -da! The middle of my Mandela. Oh, all right. Ooh, well, how pretty. So see, I, get, I, I, I have been doing this stuff. I'm just a little bit behind you guys, that's all. Oh, it's, it's beautiful. It's so nice. Look, she's like, oh, no, I'm not a very good artist. Look, you got perfect lightning bolts going across that canvas. I don't want to hear it anymore from you. You, you know what you're doing. No, no, I really don't, but I'm learning, and I'm loving learning, so looking good i'm so glad you're you're enjoying and you're and you're taking risks trying something new and that's really how we grow is we just keep practicing and maybe you know say well i don't know what i think about that technique or idea but why not try it and see what happens so thank you uh, that is um the mandela class from that we had in november so i hope you're going to continue to work on that um because it looks like you could maybe add another little piece there you know another panel if you wanted to I, I can, but I stole one of the panels to make a Christmas gift for my brother, so. It is yours. You do with it as you please. I, I made him a gift of leaves. Very so. nice. Well, thank you, Miss Barbara. I'm going to yeah. cancel your spotlight here if you want to turn thank you. off there. <laughs> cool. Okay. All right. Well, friends, I, I appreciate you uh, taking the time having the courage uh, to participate in this activity and then sharing the results of your uh, your time and efforts. So I, I hope you enjoyed it enough that you would like to continue with painting watercolors, maybe not necessarily phrases, but as uh, Ms. Pamela was doing there, she started a little more of an illustration. And so if you like the flow of watercolor, you could make some pretty watercolor patterns and that be the work of art in itself. It doesn't necessarily have to have text. Um, so please continue doing that type of work if you enjoy it. I'm happy to uh, answer any questions. If you would like to take your watercolors to the next level, shoot me an email and then I'll be happy to uh, go over some advanced techniques or share some video tutorials with you if you want to learn more and develop your watercolor skills. 
All right, friends. Well, that's all I have. I'm so happy you spent uh, the afternoon or uh, evening now with me. Uh, this afternoon, I was pulling together some of these mat boards and, and I, I usually use a uh, cardstock for my mats instead of the mat board or the construction paper. I, I'll use the cardstock because it is a little bit thicker, a little bit more substance to it. Uh, so I was checking out some, you know, paper that I had at home, and I remembered that in the past I did use construction paper. Um, oh, let's see. I had a question. Oh, mass move down rubber cement. Um, so yes, uh, in the past in college, um, this is a great. Um, who said that? That's a great idea. Was that Pam? Was that you? Okay. So in the past, you can use rubber cement as a blocking medium. Uh, you have to be careful when rubbing over watercolor paper or paper that's very fibrous because too much rubbing or too much even erasing can end up starting peeling the layers of the paper back. I remember, you know, when I was doing watercolors in college, there would be sections I just couldn't get right. And so I put watercolor down and then I remove it and more watercolor and remove it. And so anything that you do a lot with, with fibers type of materials can start to lift it up and can cause a problem. But if you put a light coat of rubber cement, um, as Ms. Pam uh, suggested, uh, it can act like a batiking, I guess. It would block that area, you put your watercolor, and then just gently rub it away. And rubber cement is one of those uh, materials that you are gonna want to have proper ventilation with. If you are the one that likes uh, the smell of gasoline, then it is right up your alley. <laughs> so, uh, it is definitely a, a chemical smell and it take, takes me back to my college days, <laughs> but it is a very good adhesive. Ms. Pam, did you have anything to, um, to, to touch on that? Go ahead and unmute yourself there. There's, there's another kind of masking that's out there that's more new. I'm, I, I went and took a watercolor class in, I think, 84, so I'm really aging myself. But the thing is that the masking is like, if you want to do a picture like a sailboat, sails are typically white, the white caps on the water is white. You don't want to have paint in that area. So you sketch out your picture and this is where drawing on the paper is normal, it's typical. You go through and you have an eraser and you wipe away as much of the pencil as possible before painting it, but you still have a, a hint of what you're going to do. You put the masking material down in the white areas that you want to keep white, like that Starburst that uh, I think, uh, I'm not sure who did it, but it was beautifully done. And if you can imagine it all being white, like pristine white, it would just really pop. And just really, the difference when you learn how to use masking material, like rubber cement, and yes, you have to then like, the door open is a great idea, or you're going to be higher than a kite in no time at all. Doctors won't be happy with you. So use ventilation, try the rubber cement. You're not using a lot of it. You're not using the brush that comes in the rubber cement. You're going to use a tiny brush like this like this okay because you're going to dictate where you want that paint that rubber cement to go and when you're all done and you rub it off you're going to be looking at that and you're going to go wow you know because it makes all the difference in the world if you want your letters to be white and your background to be dark rubber cement's your friend but if you want your background light your letters dark then you want to keep it the way you did. But don't be afraid to experiment with it, you know. And they have this new uh, blocking agent that it's white. It's a, uh, you put it down and it almost looks like a paint. It comes in a bottle that's about this big. It's not overly expensive. It has a really super fine tip, needle type tip and you can really direct the traffic. You don't need a brush to put that down at all. And you can use it on any 
kind of artwork. Like if you're doing um, a portrait and you want to have highlights of white in the hair or on the teeth of your person that you're drawing, that blocking agent is a godsend because it not only blocks paint, it blocks marker, it blocks pencil, it blocks pen, it blocks everything. The same as rubber cement does, but this really can direct the traffic with that needle point bottle. Miss Pam, if you wouldn't mind, please, um, will you send me an email with that uh, product information and I'll email that out to everybody. And so if they would like to experiment with that, I can be sure that they have the correct uh, product. Yes, okay. I, I, I'll be happy to, because I have some here at the house. So I, I'll be glad to, I use it quite a bit. Thank you. Okay, uh, is there anyone else who would like to um, uh, have some last comments or say anything before we wrap up today's class? I have, I'm gonna open up the floor here. All right, well, ladies, thanks so much for spending the evening with me. I hope you enjoyed this activity. I am still working on, oh, great question, okay. Where can we find more paper? Fantastic question. So you can get watercolor paper really at any arts and crafts store. And I want to say I have actually seen watercolor pads at stores just like Walmart. The, um, there's different qualities of the watercolor paper. But uh, when you are looking at the paper, you want to feel want to feel the paper and just the corner of it, but you want to feel a texture. And I'm sure that when you were looking at the watercolor paper that you have, you can actually see that rippling texture and you can feel a bit of texture in it. Uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be super thick like the watercolor paper that you have, but you definitely want a little bit of texture. And to be honest with you, each watercolor artist has their own personal uh, choice selection for their paper and it's really one of those testing types of things that you find what you like just like a musician or a singer has a certain microphone that they think is there makes them sound the best every, the same way with paper and painting or creating paper arts Miss Taylor did you have it oh you've got something to show okay I have, this one is a multimedia right here this is for any kind of artwork that you want to do. It's watercolor, it's thick. Um, it's thicker than your typical sketch paper, but it's not as thick as what the watercolor paper that you uh, were talking about, Dana. But the watercolor paper, that it comes in a book just like this, or in a tear the page out kind of a book, a flip book kind of. Um, I have that too, it, and I use it all the time. It's inexpensive. Where does it Where does it come from, Pam? I get mine from either Michaels or Walmart, whoever has it on sale. And right now, I hate to say this, because it's so hard to find art supplies. Michaels has a really awesome sale going on next week, and it's anywhere from fifty to seventy five percent off under art supplies. And so the idea is get in there, get to know who your Michaels store reps are, get online, look, and they have this paper and it's really good. I use it quite a bit when I'm teaching my art classes to the people at the senior center. And um, it's, it's worth it because you can get them for five bucks. You can get a tablet like this for five bucks. And, yeah. and it's substantial. So you can yeah. do, you can rip out the paper, make smaller pages if you wanted to, or you can still just keep it in the book itself. Right. You can get your brushes, your paint, anything you need. They've got some awesome sales. Whenever they have their sales, I go and stock up. If you saw my spare bedroom, it's just shelves of art supplies, pencils, art, paint, everything. And I just get it because I do this what you're doing, I do it for free. I take it to the seniors. And so you have to stock up on your supplies. Mm -hmm. And that's what I do. And whether you use them yourself 
or you have somebody, you give them as gifts. It's great. If you enjoy doing art as a stress management, anxiety release, depression manager, especially right now, stock up during the sales because it makes all the difference in the world. And Michael's does a military discount too. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So if you aren't getting that, get that. Yes, it is. they do. They do great discounts. I think sometimes you can get 20%. Most of the time, I think it's 15. Yeah. Well, friends, we could continue this all night long. I, this is a great discussion that, you know, I, when uh, Ms. Pam was talking, the first thing that came to my mind was, oh my goodness, they don't know anything about watercolor pencils. <laughs> so, yes, I do. <laughs> so <I> do. <laughs> that you can experiment with. And if you do enjoy watercolors, I think that the mixed media paper is ideal for experimenting, but then also get yourself another inexpensive palette of more colors. And right. like, like I was saying in my video, I use the most, the cheapest watercolors and I'll just test them out to try and figure out what, what is my grade? What, where, how, what's the darkest I can get with this shade, this color and what's the lightest I can get. And when I do that experiment, I know what I'm working with. It's very important to, to do that before you just cancel out. Oh, well, psh, that's junk. I can't use that. I don't, I, that's no good. No, take the time to do the experiment to see what, what, what's the limitations with this material. And once you get to know it, then work with it and you can create some beautiful things. I never dismiss uh, art supplies from the dollar store or in the discount bin somewhere. I never discount it because maybe I just don't know how to work with it. I don't know what the properties are of it. And mm -hmm. when I play around with it, I can figure that out and I can make something great with it. So please don't discredit anything based on the dollar amount to the art material or item. You know what I do, Dana, and it might help our classmates, is I take um, the primary colors. And this little, this has been a great ex back to the basics for me. It has more colors than we were allowed when I was taking art for painting. We were given the primary colors and said, I want you to paint this still life and I want you to make your own colors. Mm -hmm. If you don't have it, create it. And so if you needed grays, you needed to create the grays. If you needed light blue or a, a teal, you had to create it from those primary colors. So the best way to get to know how to watercolor, create your own color because then you're in control. You're in control of what your paint does and what your picture will say. At the end of the day, it'll be you that is creating that painting. Amen, sister. All right. So, ladies, what a fantastic discussion. I hope that I've encouraged and uh, the other classmates here have encouraged you to continue with watercolors or even experiment with other arts art materials that you may have been maybe interested in but didn't take the plunge and actually get into i encourage you to take the time to do it i my sister has no hobbies and i try to encourage her to do art or type of creative activities and she actually recently found that candle making is actually not so bad and she enjoys it so now she has a hobby other than you know uh, watching TV or binge watching TV shows, she has a hobby that she can develop and she can take time with and become an expert or and, uh, and learn new things about. So maybe this might not be your thing, but continue on uh, experimenting and learning if you enjoy making things or, or learning new things. Okay, so I have a great question about classes that are available. Uh, in the email, the first email I sent you, it had a whole bunch of email addresses of how to reach who for the program. How to reach me if you have questions about the class, who to reach for registering, who to reach directly for Heal Her Art program in general. And uh, so that would be Jay Little uh, email address. And uh, I will um, send that email out to, or 
uh, all those contacts in an email out after today's class with the link to the recorded session. And uh, then you'll have them again available to you if you wanted to reach out about more classes. I am in the works of finalizing the January class, which is ink painting. And I am in love with ink painting. It is amazing. You can do so much with ink painting, but I'm only going to teach you the basics and then I'm going to let you run with it. So uh, ink painting is actually alcohol ink because it uses uh, rubbing alcohol to manipulate the ink and move it around, thin it out, move it to this area, make it darker. Uh, and I'm using, uh, I do have metallic that I'm throwing in the kit also. So the January activity, I put it on the Heal Her Art Facebook page about a week and a half ago. It's got some examples of some beautiful ink paintings. Uh, the contact information and the details about that class is on Heal Her Art Facebook page. So if you would like to sign up for that, registration is still open. I encourage you, if you enjoyed creating, learning new things, we are starting from if you know nothing about ink painting because when I started I knew nothing about ink painting and so when I started creating the video tutorial for the class it was my first time doing it and so I encourage you to just come do it along with me and see what you come up with and if it's something that you like to do if it's not oh well it's a class you tried out and you learned something new and you are wiser for knowing more about ink painting Okay, friends, have a fantastic holiday, well, new year, positive vibes of the universe that we have a fantastic 2021. Um, much love to all of you out there. Thank you again for joining me and please be safe, be well, and be creative.